good to go. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Skype a Scientist Live. It's our last live session for the year. Um, we'll be joining you again in September. I hope you all have beautiful, wonderful, fun summers uh, while we're gone. Um, today, we are going to be talking about a very summertime appropriate topic, the ocean, uh, coral reefs specifically. So thank you, Shannon, for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to, uh, you know, just ask you so, so, so many questions um, about your area of expertise. Um, if you so kindly would tell us who you are, what you do, and why you like it, um, we can get the ball rolling. Everybody at home or school, um, just put in whatever questions you have into the Q&A uh, section at the bottom. Um, and uh, if we can, we're going to try to speak uh, a little slower than maybe natural, uh, because we're trying to help Jasmine um, hand as quickly as we can talk. We got some feedback last time that I uh, talked too fast. I got to slow down my East Coast speech. Um, so let's do it. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, yes. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, my name is Shannon Dixon. I'm originally from Melbourne, Florida. However, I'm in Columbus, Ohio right now. I'm doing my PhD at Ohio State University. So what I'm studying in particular, as we talked about for this session, is coral reefs. Uh, in particular, I'm looking at potential intervention strategies for restoring coral reefs uh, due to coral bleaching, right? So as temperatures are increasing, we're experiencing more mortality in coral reefs. And is there any like engineering solutions that we can use to try and save coral reefs? So it's like a kind of mini blurb of what my research focuses on. Uh, I like my work because even though I'm in Columbus, Ohio, I get to do a lot of field work um, outside of Ohio. So I get to go places like our field work currently is in Hawaii. I'm possibly going to get to go to Monaco really soon. So there's a lot of traveling and a lot of nice weather. And it's nice getting to work on something that I care about a lot. I love coral reefs. And so getting to work on potential solutions for them is feels really impactful. And I feel like I'm really making a difference with my degree. That's amazing. So coral reefs are gorgeous. We love to swim over them and look at them. Um, but broadly, why are they important in addition to being beautiful for the ocean? Yeah, so coral reefs are nurseries for a lot of fish communities. They're extremely important for tourism, right? So a lot of the coastal communities like Florida, right, relies really heavily on coral reefs for tourism and for their economy. Uh, because they're so important to fisheries and to nurseries for fish, that means that they're really important to the ecosystem and that they make sure that like the foods portion of like the world is really like reliant on the coral reef system because your baby fish are grown there and they're kept there. And if you have no baby fish, there's no big fish to eat them. And then that destroys the food web. Along with that, they provide a lot of shoreline protection. Coral reefs can uh, reduce wave impacts from storms. So a lot of that coastline erosion that you get is minimized by coral reefs. So the more coral reef loss that we experience, the more um, eco ecosystem hazards will come across and the more shoreline erosion that will happen and flooding will become really popular in these coastal regions. And those are just a few ways that coral reefs are protecting the environment, protecting you. And they're pretty, as we said, they're very pretty. Yeah, super, super important. Um, so to get to where you are, to have this job, like what did you major in um, in college and what is your degree currently working toward in now? Yeah, so my undergraduate was at Ohio State as well, but I did ecological engineering. It's kind of a newer field. It's very similar to environmental engineering. It's just something that focuses a bit more on ecosystems rather than technology focusing. So you don't need to worry about like the technicalities. But so I did engineering as my background, and I realized that I really only wanted to work with marine systems, especially coral reefs. So I was working in a lab at a time doing coral reef research with a professor in earth science. And I really liked the research there. And she proposed a project that included my engineering background. It's something she'd been wanting to do for a few years. So I applied to work with her for a PhD. And so now I'm pursuing my PhD in earth science with her under that project. Earth science, very cool. All right, thank you. Um, so Gavin wants to know, as a scuba diver, what can I do while I dive to help with coral restoration? This is what I wanna do after college. Yeah, so the most important thing is don't touch the reef. <laughs> like that's gonna be one of the big factors. Uh, education's really important too. So when you're scuba diving and you're going on these trips, if you see people who are, especially buoyancy, right? Like that's a big thing is you have these new divers who are going out by reefs. Their buoyancy control isn't really good. So 
they're fly, they're flailing about and then fins are knocking the reef, right? So if you could just inform people while they're diving to be really careful about keeping an awareness of their surroundings and not messing with things on the reef, that's probably one of the most important things you can do, especially at this age. Like it's something that you can easily do. You don't have to worry about hurting the reef. You're just there educating people to not hurt the reef. Because that's something we do see a lot is human damage to reefs because just it's hard. It's buoyancy is hard, especially when you're starting off as a diver. For sure. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we got a question from Harper from first grade. Uh, Harper wants to know about how many coral reefs are there in the world? <laughs> that's a great question. Definitely not something I know off the top of my head. A lot. Um, <laughs> a lot. Because you have to understand there's like fringing reefs, which are like off the coast. There's like patch reefs where there's like tiny reefs. And so would you consider a patch reef to be just like the one section of reef head and there's like hundreds of them all in an area? Or would you consider the reef to be the whole like encompassing patch reef, which could be hundreds, but in a certain area? So I, that's a very hard question. I'm not sure if I would know like the specific number off my head and how you would classify that. But if you Google it, there might be like a I'm secure see. answer. Yeah, I'm sure 10 different uh, answers would be completely all different from each other because of how you call a reef a reef. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, Bluey Williams class wants to know, do you have a favorite coral reef? Ooh, I feel like I'm supposed to say the Hawaiian reef that I'm working on is yeah. <laughs> probably like, but I think the Caribbean reef is really interesting in a sad way. I would just snorkel a bit in San Salvador and there's a lot of more mortality in the Caribbean sea because it has some of the worst reef conditions. And so I think it's interesting going there because it shows you such a complex view of reefs. You know, it's not like the Great Barrier Reef or reefs where there's a lot of like protection there to try and keep them preserved. And so it might be San Salvador just because it really shows what the future of reefs might look like if we don't do anything to protect them. That's a great answer. Wonderful. Um, all right, Ms. Uh, Plahetsky's fourth graders wanna know, um, how old are coral reefs? I'm sorry, what? How old are coral reefs? They can be hundreds of years old. So coral, is, coral themselves can be hundreds of years old to just newly settled. You can't even see them. They're just a polyp, right? Because coral grow very slow. I think they grow about two millimeters or two centimeters per year. So they grow very, very small. So these big coral that you're seeing, like um, rain coral, which are pretty like round, they can be the size of a room, be thousands of years old, right? But you could, but on the reef, like they're constantly spawning, which is where they're releasing their larvae into the ocean. And so there's probably tons of baby coral too, coral that have maybe been growing for a year, two years, maybe even little tiny larval coral that are just starting to grow and you can't even see them, but they're like a day old, right? So the reef itself could be spanning hundreds of thousands of years, but the coral you see probably all have different ages, right? Cool. Um, another question from that class. Do fish eat coral? Yes. Fish too. Well, more like they pluck at the algae on the coral, oh. right? So they're good because they're taking off algae, but they can damage the coral. But normally the more fish you have on a reef, the more healthy a coral reef is because it's helping pluck that algae off. So especially during coral bleaching, when you have the coral and they're expelling their algae, there's they can grow like some algae that's like bad for them will grow on them and it'll prevent them from recovering from coral bleaching. So if you have fish there plucking off the bad algae, it helps them recover from the bleaching event sooner. And whereas if there's less fish and the algae is allowed to grow completely over the coral, that coral will probably die because nothing's keeping that algae in check and it can't bite the algae itself really. Right, right. Yeah, very delicate balance. Um, what does coral feel like? Is it dangerous? Um, so depends. There's like hard coral, there's soft coral. There are coral you definitely should not touch. Uh, so coral have like nematosis, which is like these like stinging tentacles and it's how they catch their food. So some coral have like, like there's coral called fire coral. It's normally like a mustard yellow color. If you're ever snorkeling, you shouldn't touch coral really in general. Don't touch that. That'll burn you. It'll, it won't be comfortable. It won't kill you, but it, it's, it's not going to be pleasant. So there's definitely coral that can be dangerous to touch for humans. And um, soft coral can be like, as it looks pretty soft, but your hard coral, 
it's you have to remember it's like a it's a calcium carbonate structure and so beyond the tissue layer which might be a little slimy when you feel it it's going to feel hard and it's going to feel kind of like chalk with like a layer of tissue over it so it doesn't rub off but that's what the structure itself is that's what the skeleton is cool um what other things are made out of that same like stuff calcium carbonate mm -hmm. Um, any calcifying creature is going to use calcium to build its shells. So uh, bivalves, gastropods, yeah. things like that. Anything that's going to be pulling the calcium, car like CO2 from the ocean water is going to have calcium carbonate shells. And it's going to have that like clam. same skeleton. Yeah. yeah, clams, stuff like that. Very cool. If it's preserved oh. in the rock record, it's probably calcium carbonate. Nice. Sounds good. All right. Uh Carmelo and Savannah from sixth and fifth grade want to know, um, did you always want to be a scientist? Um, it's a broad question, right? Scientists. I was really interested in engineering as a kid, hence my undergraduate degree. I was really interested in computer science. I thought I wanted to program. I did robotics in high school. I realized I didn't want to program. It wasn't interesting. The computer screens all the time was not for me. I knew I wanted to do some kind of environmental work. Definitely what that entailed and how that looked kind of changed throughout my college career and like what I experienced in terms of internships and research and like classes, right? Two classes were a big component in my decision of not pursuing engineering. And after I got my degree, I was like, I don't really want to take any more engineering classes. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, engineering was also never my strong suit. I ended up being a marine biologist. Um, uh, Karen would like to know, could you tell us exactly what coral bleaching is? Yes. So coral receive their energy in two ways. So they have a symbiotic relationship with this algae, normally called their endosymbiotic algae. And then they can also eat. But a lot of coral rely on the endosymbiotic symbiotic algae, right? And so it's a mutual partnership where the coral will provide nutrients to the endosymbionts and the endosymbionts provide like the sugars and energy that the coral needs to survive. And so when the ocean temperatures rise, the relationship between the two, the coral and the algal endosymbionts breaks down. They're not good partners anymore. And so the coral will expel its algae. And so coral tissue is clear. And the color that you see comes from the endosymbiotic algae. So once it expels that algae, all you're seeing is the skeleton. That's why they're white is because you're seeing that white calcium, calcium carbonate skeleton underneath their clear tissue. And so they're not dead. That just means that they don't get energy as well from the endosymbionts. And they're not expelling all of their endosymbionts necessarily. It's just like a large proportion of them. So a lot of their energy is no longer through their symbiotic relationship. It's through eating. So my research focuses more on the feeding side, right? We're looking at once it's bleached, can we increase feeding and can we try and help coral survive the bleaching the bleaching period? Because really what happens is what's causing that death is they're starving, right? They're losing a lot of their energy. And if they can't increase their feeding, if they don't have energy reserves to rely on, they're just not going to survive because they're not able to, they're not able to fuel themselves anymore. Right, right. Okay, sounds good. Um, uh, let's see. A number of people have asked us how coral eat. And I think you basically just so, so, summarized that for us. So they, if they have that algae living inside their bodies, those algae are effectively feeding them from sunlight. And then the rest of it is like their little tentacles grabbing stuff from the water and eating it. Is that right? Yeah. So coral eat, it's eating, right? Getting right. their energy from the symbionts isn't necessarily eating. That's through photosynthesis. But if they're eating, they have the little nematosis, which are their like stinging tentacles. I don't know if my hand gestures are helpful, but so it's like these stinging no, tentacles. About right. <laughs> and so they can get particulate organic matter, which is just like floating debris in the water, or they eat these little animals called zooplankton. And so they can like catch the zooplankton, they'll like grab it and they'll digest it. And so zooplankton can be a, are about 800 micrometers and smaller, and they just float in the water water column, things like copepods, um, crab zoea, which are like little baby crab larvae before they develop into crab, things like that. Coral are decent eaters, but like we do like gut analysis where we'll like dissect the coral after feeding nights. And you can see like normally in a span of an hour out of a hundred polyps, which are just like the little tiny circles on the coral, they've, eat, they've eaten maybe one to two out of a hundred polyps. So 
all night. Like they're, they're, they're decent feeders, but not all can increase their feeding when they bleach. So. Sounds good. Uh, so you have to hope they can figure out a way to eat uh, while they're waiting for their algae to come back. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. Um, many people are asking, but what, just generally, what can we do to prevent coral from dying? Yeah, I mean, the biggest threat to coral reefs is at the end of the day, coral bleaching. It is that increased heat stress. So the biggest solution for coral reefs is going to be lowering greenhouse gas emissions, right? Like trying to lower the temperatures of the ocean, trying to make sure that we're not increasing the carbon dioxide um, emission in the atmosphere. That's, that's really hard to do though, right? Especially as an individual. So trying as much to lower your carbon footprint is important. And just education, right? And reaching out to local legislators, writing letters. There's a lot you can do as an individual, but it is an insurmountable feat. And it's hard to do stuff, especially when you're inland, right? And it doesn't feel like you're really seeing the reefs. But definitely lowering greenhouse gas emissions is the first priority in terms of helping corals. Yeah. Talk to your elected officials. Make sure that even if you're in Ohio, even if you're in Minnesota, somewhere far from a coral reef, the atelum is still important to you. That's good. That's very good. Uh, Mrs. Thomas's class wants to know what's your favorite place that you've been while traveling? And do jellyfish live in coral reefs? <laughs> um, hmm. play, traveling for work or just traveling? <laughs> I've been, I, this is my first year of my PhD. So traveling for classes, it's really only been two places Hawaii and San Salvador. Um, I think my favorite place so far has been Oahu, Hawaii. We stay on like a little research island. So we like take the ferry over and we like stay in the like student dorms. And that's been really cool. And like getting to do a lot of field work every day. It's like a different kind of like lifestyle than lab work, which is what I do when I'm here in Columbus. Um, is that Kiwala? And then do jellyfish. Hmm? Are you, do you visit Kiwala or a different island? Uh, we go to Oahu. Uh, it's where the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology is, and we work in Kaneohe Bay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I used to collect flint there, too. Um, yeah, I'm actually weirdly enough wearing my Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology shirt. Nice, very cool. Um, awesome. All right. And, and then, yes, jellyfish do live. There are jellyfish that do, like, float around. And there's, like, some jellyfish in Kaneohe Bay that are called, like, Cassiopeia, and they, like, lay on the floor of the sea, which are, they're cool. They, like, float. Don't be careful not to step on them. <laughs> Yeah, they live in Florida too. They live uh, all over the place. They're, those are really, really cool. Um, Cassiopeia are awesome. Um, let's see. Um, sorry, I'm, there's a lot of uh, repeated questions. I'm trying to pick one out. What percentage of coral is dying or bleaching per year? Ooh, that's a good question. And that is one that I will be honest, I don't know off the top of my head. That's fine. I'd say a large amount and it's probably gonna and it's gonna differ based off the reef right so you probably want to look at like what percentage of the great Bear reef is bleaching versus what percentage of the caribbean reef versus hawaiian like there's probably not a number in terms of total they're also still trying to find ways of quantifying that right like technology it's hard reefs are really big and so beyond pulling a camera and scaling large areas of reefs every day during bleaching events it's hard to really quantify the level of bleaching that you're experiencing on a wide scale but it's definitely something people are looking into and I don't know the specific number off the top of my head I'm sorry okay. that's fine could you tell us a little bit more about like how a brand new coral would form yeah I think I think it follow. so coral um also there's not every coral species is different right but in general coral wide they like wide spawn where they release their sperm and their eggs into the water column. And then the sexual reproduction happens and coral, like these little things, they'll land on substrate, normally on other parts of the reef, right? Other calcium carbonate structures. Um, for reef restoration, a lot of people are looking into like what substrates they can put out on reefs and which substrates work best for coral restoration in terms of like, how can you recruit coral? That's like a bunch of dead coral, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you'll have these little coral larvae and then they're just like a singular polyp and then they just grow, right? Because they're, they're a colony, so they're all identical. So it'll just grow out in the, the number of polyp counts will increase, it'll get wider, it'll start to form calcium carbonate shells. Every year it'll like deposit some calcium or some carbonate and then it just gets wider. I don't know how that's that could have an explanation, but I feel like it gets a lot more technical, the more scientific you get into Before it. There you go, the uh, more big words that will be needed. Yeah. In fact, yeah, they, uh, the larvae settle, 
and they make some crusty yeah. stuff and then they get bigger, 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 grow on top of each other. Um, wonderful. Okay. So from Oaks High School in Colorado, what successes have there been with artificial reefs? Yeah. Um, I know more about strategies than like names of specific reefs that have been doing well. I know Florida's really struck, really trying their hardest efforts in terms of developing artificial reefs because as I said, the Caribbean reefs, one of the worst ones. So there's a lot of, if you're really interested in knowing like the technicalities, there's a lot of efforts there if you wanted to look into that. Um, some of the strategies, so we're building a living reef off the coast of Hawaii is what I'm, my project's being funded by. It's a DARPA project. Cool. And so some of the intervention techniques that they're looking at doing is people have considered doing misters on the reef to try and lower the ocean temperature and create more of a fog. That way it reduces the UV intensity um, when you're developing an artificial reef, they found that sound is really important, right? So if you have these artificial reef sounds underwater that sound like fish, you attract real fish and you might attract coral larvae, like, because maybe when they're deciding where they're going to land, that sound is important because the sounds of, an, of a healthy reef tells them that that's a healthy place to live. Um, the specific technology I'm working on would, is uh, coral. So coral, I mentioned like to eat zooplankton. And we know that zooplankton are attracted to light, like the concentration of zooplankton increases with light. They're kind of like gnats to like a flame or moths to a flame. And so our idea is if we stick these little underwater lights down next to coral following bleaching events or during bleaching events, we can increase the concentration of zooplankton around the coral and that'll help them eat more because there'll be more food. So that's specifically what my research is looking at. Um, there's shading where people will do artificial shading and they'll put out shade cloths over the reef. I've heard um, artificial upwelling, which is where you would pump cold water, potentially with nutrients from the shore into the ocean. The level of energy that would require and the feasibility of that one still kind of up in the air. Some people have talked about going more into the genetic side and breeding super coral. It's There's a fine line with any kind of engineering intervention with coral reefs, right? Because you're introducing non-native species and what would that do to the ecosystem there? But if you already have a dead reef, can it really hurt to do anything else to it? There's a lot of ethics involved in determining what are the best solutions going forward for coral reef, artificial reefs especially. But it's kind of a mixed bag. If you're really interested in it, I know there's a good, I forgot what the name of the paper is, so it might not be a helpful recommendation, but there is a paper that goes really in depth on like comparing the different current strategies based off cost effectiveness, time intensity, and what the real outcome would look like and if it's worth it. Yeah, there's also um, an ologies episode on um, coral biology with Shale Matsuda. Um, so that that one, I think, does a nice job of explaining all of this all over again um, in, in, in language that most folks can understand. Um, sometimes the primary literature is um, a bit of a uh, jump off the deep end, you know, but the but ologies is really nice. There's also a um a documentary that folks really like called Chasing Coral. Um, I think it also focuses on folks in Hawaii. Um, so that might be a good like supplementary piece to this Q and A for folks at home or in school. Um, for here's the next question. Jasmine wants to know from Garden Spot, how far down do coral grow? Do they grow lower than ocean plants can? So there are deep water coral like hundreds of meters deep coral. And then there's coral that can live by like CO2 vents and stuff. Um, it just changes like the, like there's, it just means that they probably don't have symbionts, right? And there are coral that don't have that endosymbiotic algae and they rely on heterotrophy to live or particular organic carbon. So yeah, coral can live very deep, just not all species, right? It just kind of depends on the species and if they're symbiotic or if they're asymbiotic. But yeah, I know that, at least a few hundred meters, because my advisor had a paper on looking at deep sea coral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, deep sea coral is really interesting and cool. Um, so oh, that's the same question, how deep are coral reefs? Um, what is the biggest coral reef? And you can answer that in terms of uh, size of the whole ecosystem or individual chunk of coral. Great question. Once again, my research focuses predominantly in Hawaii. So in terms of knowing stats of other reefs, I'm not sure. I would guess the Australian Great Barrier Reef is the largest reef in the world. That seems right to me. I don't know about in terms of species diversity, 
or in terms of like ecosystem diversity, but I would say in terms of coral coverage, it's, I would believe, I think that was the largest. I could be wrong I, though. I Don't also think the Great Barrier Reef, but I also, I'm, I'm definitely not a coral person. Uh, I, I know I, I, that's my guess too, but I'm not really sure. Um, let's see. Uh, so I'm from fourth grade from uh, Mr. Hanald's class wants to know, how does coral grow just in one spot and not just like all over the place? So an individual colony grows in one spot and it grows outward. But when you're looking at a coral reef, like you have to understand just because you see a coral head over there, like if you think if, you, if they're the same species and one's over there and one's over here, that doesn't mean that it was here and it grew all the way over here. Those are probably two different colonies. They're probably genetically distinct, right? So when you're looking at a reef, don't think of it as like all, it's just one and it's all grown outward. It's probably likely that there's hundreds to there's thousands, right? And they're all growing individually in that from one place. So it's kind of makes. like a meadow with many different yeah. plants, not one big thing. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks. Um, Ashley would like to know, um, could you talk a little bit about ocean acidification and how that affects uh, coral reefs? Yeah, so there's still a lot unknown about how ocean acidification is going to impact reefs, especially in synergy with ocean warming. So essentially, the ocean has a carbonate equilibrium system with their pH, and so it rests at about like 8.1 is like a good ocean pH. And so as CO2 emissions increase, the carbon dioxide is drawn in from the ocean. And so normally the equilibrium system has like these two processes, right? And so normally when they're in sync, it can regulate it. But when the when the CO2 increases, the second process doesn't work as fast as the first process does. So what that's just doing is it's creating a lot of carbonic acid. So you're having a lot more acidity in the ocean and the second process isn't catching up fast enough to turn that into calcium carbonate and to make it basic. And so essentially the ocean's becoming more acidic because of the increased CO2 in the emissions, which is why greenhouse gas emissions are pretty important to lower. Um, so in terms of projecting to future ocean acidification, we're unsure how that will, in, like there's a lot of papers that are starting to look into how ocean acidification impacts coral. It seems pretty species dependent at this point. However, one thing is no matter, depending on the degree, right? If it gets so acidic, at the end of the day, the coral are calcium carbonate structures. And so there will be reef net, there'll be net reef dissolution if it's too acidic. Like there's just, it'll just dissolve the basic in the skeleton and it'll just, the whole reef will just start to dissolve on itself. So very bad, but where we're seeing projections of the rate of CO2 emissions and where ocean acidification is going to be in like 2050, 2100, it's currently kind of a question on how that's really going to impact reefs and what that'll do while ocean warming is going on. Because there's a bit of a, like a counterbalance between the two where like ocean acidification kind of minimizes. We're seeing some of the minimization of the ocean warming impacts, but at some point it's going to be too warm and it's going to be too acidic. So it's a very layered answer and I hope that that was not too complex. Sometimes things are complex. Uh, okay, so from Lauren, um, if a coral has gotten rid of its algae, um, can that individual organism recover or does a new coral polyp need to take its place? No, absolutely. It can. The minute that the coral's feeling, like the temperatures relax a little bit and the coral's feeling healthier, it'll start picking that algae right back up. And as right. I said, it doesn't expel all of its algae. It's more like it goes from having maybe a concentration of like, a hundred thousand in a millimeter to like a hundred in a millimeter. So there's still some algae there. And once it's feeling, once recovery is happening, it'll start taking that algae again. The cool. current issue is like the bleaching events are happening so close to one another that that recovery period just isn't long enough for a lot of coral to get their algae back and to get some energy reserves to survive the next bleaching event is kind of what that threshold's looking at, looking like right now. Sounds good. The next question um, is again from high school seniors. Um, how did you get involved in research projects during your undergrad? Yeah, um, weirdly enough, I kind of stumbled across the lab I'm working in now. Uh, I found I had just been like, I really want to do ocean research. And I came from Florida 
to Ohio State where there's no marine research, <laughs> like there's no marine science certi- like program. There's obviously marine science research here. And so I was just kind of like Googling like coral reefs and I came across a TED talk by the advisor who I work for now. And I was like, I didn't even know she was here. And so I set up a meeting just because I was curious. I wasn't really interested in working in the lab at that point. I just wanted to know like, what does Marines, like what does that path look like, right? How does one go from undergrad into being a professor into going into marine science and doing marine science research? And she offered me a research position like in the lab for the summer as a volunteer, it was not paid, it was volunteer. So I'd say if you know from the start that you want to do research, because I I didn't, it was kind of luck. Uh, But if you know from the start that you're interested in it, looking like whatever school you go into, looking at research related to the field you want to do, and just scheduling meetings with the professors, right? Like don't even start off by saying that you want to work in their lab, because sometimes you'll just get an immediate no, right? And so if you're already meeting with them, and you're meeting in person, and they're getting to know your personality, it's a little easier to kind of wedge into, oh, well, do you have any opportunities for volunteer work in the lab? Because at that point, like, they kind of have a gist of who you are, you've been able to talk to them, you've shown an interest in their research, rather than just, like, an email, like, hi, my name's blah, 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 and do you have any positions in your lab? And they don't know you, and they don't, they've never even seen you. There's also a lot of opportunities you can get with your class, like, if you're taking a class, and you like the professor, and you know that they do research that's interesting. If you're taking their class already, that's always like a good point to go up and like introduce yourself and be like, I'm interested in working in your lab. I know a lot of people who get lab positions through their professors, but you're always free to email whoever you want, even if it's not in the field that you're majoring in. Like I I did that. Definitely just like networking and getting to meet with a professor face-to-face is really helpful. Great, yeah. Always remember all of these people that are giving us all jobs, they're just humans. And think about what would be hard for you to say no to. That might also be hard for them to say no to. So if they should show up all nice and look for a job, maybe you'll get one. Um, that's really good advice, Shannon. I love that. Um, our next question is from Janaya in fourth grade. In your training or your your work, have you ever encountered a blue ring octopus? I have not. No, I'm have curious. Not. No, I want to. <laughs> I, I did one time, I, but it was a baby, so it wasn't blue yet. Uh, I was collecting squid in Japan and one was floating around. Um, that was a, a wild day. Um, are there, okay. We have, you said that there are a bunch of animals that eat the algae off of coral reefs. Um, parrotfish, I know have those like chompy beaks that bite the coral. Are, are they actually eating the whole polyp and everything, or are they just eating the algae off the top? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. I'm still pretty, since I'm still so new in my PhD, I haven't done a lot of research on like the interactions between the reef and like fish. I would guess if they're taking a good enough chomp, they're probably, I think, I think they're they get the quite fish. into the polyp. I think they get into the skeleton if I'm not wrong. That's what I think too. So when, um, when you go to a beach, that's all like white sand, like a little crumbly coral, oftentimes that's parrotfish poop because the parrotfish eat some of the shell and then like crunch it up in their stomachs and then poop out sand. So when you go to these gorgeous white sand beaches, a lot of that, you're just sitting on parrotfish poop. Thanks parrotfish. Um, I don't totally know exactly what they're trying to get at, but I think it's, I think it's the polyp. Um, I'll have to ask my buddy Corey who like studies parrotfish. Um, maybe I'll text him now. I'd be curious. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll get the answer eventually. Um, Kelly wants to know, what is your favorite animal in a coral reef community? Ooh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal my, uh, fellow, I have another PhD student in my lab and she introduced me to these things called nudibranchs. They are the cutest things. They're like these little sea slugs and they can be bright colored and pretty. I only like the pretty ones. There's one that's like eat that ate all of my coral and my experiment. They ate like an entire species. And so I don't, I don't like that one, whatever that was like, it's called Vistella. Not a fan of that nudibranch particular, but there's like really pretty ones. And there's one called like the Spanish dancer. And it's like red with like yellow trim. And they're like really little. They just like dance in the water column. So pretty. For any of you that are out in California, living in California, go tide pooling, look really closely they're there. It's so cool. Um, I live in Philadelphia and we don't have a single nudibranch here, but they're really, really, really cool. 
love those animals. Um, we got a question from Noah and uh, Ratika in fifth grade. Is it a good idea to trans transplant Arabian Gulf coral to other places because they are uh, super tolerant of hot temperatures? Yeah, so that's kind of what I was saying. It's like the big question right now of when you're trying to transplant coral. Well, I'd say there's two sides, right? So one, the coral, the Arabian coral, they're really good with heat stress. But maybe you're going to move them to an environment that they like, maybe there's really high flow in the environment you're moving them to, and maybe they're not suited for high, high turbidity, right? So the thing with coral is normally if they're really good at one thing, they're bad in other areas, right? There's trade-offs, right? So maybe you're really good at heat stress, but you're not good with lower pH, or you're not good with certain like symbiodiniaceae communities in the water column. Like, so when you're transplanting, yeah, it might have the potential to do well in that area. It might just die though, because there's just so much, there's just so many factors that impact a coral health that you're not really looking at the full picture when you're looking at them in the Arabian Sea, you're not considering maybe all the factors, like all the environmental factors that they're getting there that are making them survive well in that certain environment, that if you move them maybe even to a different area in the Gulf, like in the Red Sea, they might not do, they might not even do well there, right? right. So there's some trade-offs there. I think the big thing with transplanting with any kind of ecosystem intervention where you're like let's introduce this non-native species to this area you always run that big what if of what if that species does too well and kills off the other like other things in that environment that are necessary for that ecosystem to function right like honeysuckle in ohio are extremely invasive lionfish in florida are invasive like there's a lot of creatures that just you don't like you don't know when you introduce them what the real repercussions are until it's later down the line. And so the big question with coral reef restoration and transplanting coral right now is at what point does that not matter, right? So if you've right. got a dead reef and there's nothing living there anyways, no fish, only a bunch of algae covering the coral, like the dead coral heads, like maybe it doesn't matter if you transplant a coral there. And maybe it's not what the ecosystem used to look like, but we were never, we were never going to get back to that. And it's okay. And at least there's now something living there and there's some kind of community. So it's a, it's a double-sided coin and a lot of it has to do with legislation, right? Yeah. So it's hard to predict how a coral species is going to do when you transplant it. And it's hard to say what an ecosystem is going to do if you transplant a coral species there. So Sorry, not really a good yes or no answer there, but I think that's often the case. With restoration. Yeah. Yeah. That's coral often... restoration would look a lot different if there was a clear yes or no answer. Yeah. Um, coral biology is like really interesting because it really feels like the Wild West in terms because like it, it, it's it's a it's a group of animals that is doing generally worse than a lot of other things that humans are impacting. And so in some cases, it's like a, it's like a emergency throw anything at the wall to see what sticks type situation um and over time we're going to be more more ecosystems are going to be in the same boat and i feel like you all in coral biology are really like leading the charge and of experiencing this like uh really bad situations and just being like whoa let's see what <laughs> happens it's um troubling but interesting all at the same time um, we've got time for about one more question and a couple people have asked, including Bridge Academy, Locust Grove uh, Middle School in Orange, Virginia, and Mrs. Cross's class, specifically Ben, wants to know, uh, can you own coral? Can they have coral in their classrooms? Can you like like coral farming? That's pretty, mm, that's or, really common. Yeah. A lot of people have coral ecosystems. Um, they're a little temperamental. <laughs> I won't lie. That's not clear from this talk. They they like certain conditions. Um they're really finicky. So we have a coral farm here in Ohio that sells coral for recreational coral farmers and people who want to have coral reef aquariums. You can do it. You just have to make sure that the nutrients in the water are correct. The pH balance is correct. They're very finicky, but the people who can keep them alive, they, they love them. They're obsessed with them. Yeah. I'd recommend starting with something a little simpler. Like if, if you've never had a fish tank ever, start with a goldfish. And then when you get good at that, add some marine fishes because marine fish, keeping those in an aquarium is a bigger pain in the butt than a, a freshwater system because you have to not only worry about 
all of the chemicals that the animals are producing, but also the salt content. And like, so there's so many things you have to be checking and keeping exactly right. Um, so that could get good at that. And then maybe try an invertebrate. Invertebrates are very finicky, uh, squid yeah. included. My God, keeping those things alive. And you, is hard. and you have to be really careful where you source them from. So if you have right. like a nice coral aquarium started up, you want to be really careful where you're buying them from because if they're not quarantined, they can carry diseases on them and then they kill your whole reef. I, I've heard the woes of coral husbandry. It's, I think they're pretty. I don't think I would ever personally try to keep any alive. I don't think I could do it. I can't even keep a plant alive. So it's hard. It's hard. Um, okay. So we always ask everybody the same two questions at the end of the sessions. The first question, if you had everyone's attention in the whole world and you could tell them one thing about your area of expertise, what do you tell them? You know, I think we kind of briefly touched on it already of what you could do as an individual. I think, you know, don't discount what you can do right now. Writing to legislation is really important, educating people and just really making the voice spread. You know, the more people who understand what's happening to the coral reef ecosystems and how that impacts you, even if you're in a state that doesn't have an ocean, it's just really important to know and to kind of spread the awareness because the more people you get paying attention to it, the more change we can do as a society, the more we can pressure the government to put some pressure on these big companies because there's only so much you can lower your greenhouse gas emissions right but as a whole if we could put more pressure on these big corporations and the people really responsible for these large co2 emissions like the more we can do to try and maybe save the coral reefs because right now it's not looking like they're going to be there's going to be much by 2050. sounds good thank you um and then the second question is you still have everybody's attention in the world you can tell them a thing about anything and it can be serious and important or it can be silly and fun it can be whatever you want what do you tell them um, I'd say, you know, it's really hard choosing what you want to do with your life when you're 18, you know, going out and going into college and you're spending four years on a degree. It's never too late to change. And at the end of the day, like use college to really find what you love, right? Because at the end of the day, you want a job that doesn't feel like work, right? You want it to be your passion. You want to have, you want to be able to work for money, but money that you enjoy getting right? Something you love, something that makes you happy. You wake up in the morning and you're just excited, right? Because no one wants a job where you're miserable. So use all the time you have to explore different fields, different things that you didn't think you'd do, different hobbies. Because I mean, if I had never really explored outside of engineering, I never would have thought to do marine science. It never really crossed my mind. And I'd probably be staring at a computer doing coding, which I hate doing. <laughs> Sounds good. That's really good advice. Thank you so much. Um, is there anything else that you want to plug that you want to share with us? Anything at all uh, while you have the floor? Um, I think so. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with us. This has been super cool and fun. Thank you all at, at school for, for coming and asking your questions. Um, much like many of these sessions, we had so many questions. We tried to get through as many as we could. We actually answered the same number of questions uh, that we didn't answer. So we got through exactly precisely half of them. Um, Teachers, if you want to have your own session with just your class, we have so many scientists available for free for you. So if you want to sign up for a session, whether you want to talk about marine biology some more, if you want to talk about engineering, robots, whatever the heck you want, we can uh, hook you up with a match. Don't hesitate to sign up for more sessions. We've got them available. We're here for you to use. Um, otherwise, uh, we hope you have a wonderful, fun, filled, safe summer. Um, we will see you back here um, in September for the for the Q&A sessions. Otherwise, have a good one. If you want something specific for the fall, send me an email, skypeascientist at gmail.com, and I will try to book a scientist for you all uh, that studies that thing. Um, thanks again, Shannon. Uh, thank you, Jasmine, for interpreting. You're the best. Um, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming. Bye.